Gresham College presents Long Finance Spring Conference 2012, Part 3 Investing as if the Future Mattered by Dr Matthew Kiernan, Innovest Strategic Value Advisors. Thank you very much um, and I'd like to thank uh, Michael for two things. One, for the invitation and secondly, uh, I'd prepared actually inspired by uh, Hugo Chavez who recently came back from cancer surgery and wanted to demonstrate that he was hale and hearty and gave a nine-hour speech. So I had prepared a ten-hour speech, but Michael suggested we cut it back to ten minutes. So um, not only am I indebted to Michael for that, but you will be as well. Um, just as a, an aside before I begin, um, there was a good discussion just now, and, and thank you for your remarks, it was great. Um, about, you know, are, is there a banking system anywhere in the world that should be emulated? And um, I confess to being a Canadian, although I'm a bit of a racist, I'm kind of an anti-Canadian racist, but I'm a Canadian. And um, we went in the space, thanks to the financial crisis, of, of two years, our banking fraternity, of which I'm not a member, uh, went from being dull, plodding, and unimaginative to being prudent and genius. And so, of course, the Canadian banking system in many quarters is regarded, I think, very highly. Um, so what used to be called complete lack of imagination and IQ is now prudent stewardship. So as a Canadian, I'm, I'm delighted to be here. And hopefully some of the reflected glory of our banking system can shine on me. Um, the, the topic of what I want to say today is, again, uh, investing as if the future mattered. And I'm primarily but not exclusively talking about equity investing, by the way. But let's, let's start with a quick snapshot of where we are today in terms of long-term investing. Um, we know a couple of things. We know that high-frequency trading um, it represents about 70% of the volume of the New York Stock Exchange and 77, a higher percentage, here in London. So that's just factoid number one. Um, even more troubling, uh, I was told recently, and this is not uh, an academically impeccable case, but I was told that one of the major investment banks uh, had a major conference uh, last summer, and the chief, a lot of senior chief investment officers at the conference, and um, they were polled on what their investment horizons were. And uh, it doesn't give one a huge amount of comfort to tell you that um, eighty percent of them their their investment horizon was a year or less, and fifty five percent of them it was a quarter so that ladies and gentlemen, is the world that we currently live in um, hence it 's very uh, i 'm very happy and honored to be talking about long finance um, so I, I can do no better actually than to quote the legendary Professor K from yesterday's FT, and I quote, the, the damage done by presenting spurious profit figures derived by marketing assets to delusionary market values or computed from hypothetical model-based valuations has been literally incalculable. I, I would say, you know, amen to that. What I also want to do, and we'll be talking more on the panel about, is bring two very close cousins together, long-term investing in general and sustainability, which for shorthand purposes I'll regard today as investing, A, investing as if the future mattered with explicit and systematic attempt to environmental and social, uh, environmentally and socially generated risk and opportunity in an investment portfolio. Um, so let's go from the macro to, to some specific examples of, of where we sit today. Uh, we, we live in a world where, um, can I just see quickly show of hands, how many people in the audience have heard of the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment? Um, could I have a show of hands of how many of you knew that until midnight the night before um, and a very stern phone call from Kofi Annan, the UN wasn't going to sign the UN Principles the next day? One. You've read my book. <laughs> You're the person. Um, it, I, call me hypercritical, but I, I find that troubling. And, and 
ditto uh, at the World Bank, which I don't think has signed them, um, and both of their staff pension funds, which of course are funded by people who are devoting their careers to, among other things, environmental and social objectives. Not one dime of those pension funds is currently invested with even a passing glance at the environmental or social performance risk condition of the companies they invest in. I find that depressing. Um, uh, you know, one can go on. The Gates Foundation, the Ford Foundation, um, I, I say this blushingly because a friend of mine runs it now, but the Nature Conservancy, we can guess what they do for a living on the grant side of their foundation. Their endowment is $2 billion U.S., and uh, not a dime of it is subjected to any analysis whatsoever. So if you ask the CEO of the Nature Conservancy tomorrow, uh, any idea what percent of the good stuff you're doing on the grant giving side is being completely overwhelmed and vitiated by your investment strategies. Is it, you know, are you undoing 100% of it, 200% of it, 5% of it? Um, so this, this again, is a um, parlous state of affairs in my view. Uh, wanted to talk a little bit about why this is and I guess, in my mind, it comes down to a couple of things. Uh, two in particular, two of the most powerful forces of nature, uh, personal intellectual inertia and collective organizational inertia. I th those are infinitely renewable resources, it seems. Um, we just never seem to run out of them. And I think any explanation for what I've just described that doesn't address those barriers explicitly is disingenuous, um, I would argue. With specific uh, regard to environmental and social issues, a huge part of the problem in my humble view is that um, there's been a tremendous confusion and conflation of an alphabet soup of acronym initials. So there's, we've got SRI, ESG, SI, RI, CSR, and um, I have uh, proposed in a, in a recent paper that we do away with all of those because it, it causes no end of confusion and replace it with a single acronym, which I will propose today, SAI. And that stands for Strategically Aware Investing. In other words, investing as if you actually checked your watch and recognized that you're in the 21st century. Now. I won't belabor this because everyone in the room knows uh, about the major environmental, social, structural, secular megatrends, whether it's population, water, you name it. Everybody knows about those things. Um, and taken together, I would argue that they constitute literally a revolution in the basis of competitive advantage for companies, i.e. the companies that investors invest in. So, climate change, I mean, the list is endless. Um, I think you could get most chief investment officers in this world to readily say, yeah, no, I understand that. I, I know the world's population is headed towards nine billion. I know uh, pollution's getting worse. I know climate change is a major issue, blah, 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 blah. And so you go, okay, so you, you agree. Yeah, oh yeah, totally. So, if you looked at your investment process, your models, your assumptions, the kinds of research you use, the process by which you integrate it and do investing. Could you just refresh my memory on how that process has changed one iota from 1950? And uh, one of our uh, fellow panelists uh, in the next session, Valérie Lucas Leclerc, is one of a relatively small elite group around the world who could say with a straight face, absolutely, that you know, this, the way we contribute to the investment process is very different from 1950. But most uh, asset managers, if, the, if they're honest, and that's a, a tough uh, species to uncover, but if they're honest, they could not point you to a single source of research, input into an analytical model, etc., that is in any way fundamentally different than what they used to do 60, 70 years ago. Um, 
a lot of reasons for that, but most of it, I think, again, uh, intellectual, organizational inertia, cognitive impairment, um, but also uh, all of what I've just described I, I would categorize as passive inertia. But then there's a more virulent strain called, that I call active inertia, which sounds like a bit of an oxymoron. But active inertia is, again, not born out of ignorance, but born out of narrow, short-term self-interest. That it is simply not in my interest as a dominant player in the status quo to rock the boat and to change the status quo. So I have erected all sorts of barriers in the way of, uh, of a transformation. Um, and we see that around us constantly, every day. Um, with respect to long-term investing specifically, um, I'd like to propose with, with uh, an apology ahead of time to my friends in the socially responsible investment community who may be horrified by what I'm about to say and may regard me as an apostate and a heretic. But I think most of us in this room have probably been making, trying to make the case in the advocacy for long-term investing on, on some sort of normative basis. Um, we, we should be doing this for A, B, C, D, E reasons, economic, social, environmental, and a litany of others. Um, that clearly, based on some of the statistics I mentioned at the beginning, that ain't working. So I would invite the group to, to at least consider a, a different tack. And again, this may be heretical to some. Um, maybe the debate should be recouched as, look, it's sim this is what we're talking about here is simply a way to make more money. Because this is the mother of all arbitrage opportunities, and, and we would call it time arbitrage. Because of the short-termism that we all know about, um, and companies respond to it in a self-exacerbating feedback loop, um, securities generally, in my view, are priced with essentially little or no regard to some of these longer term slow burning issues like climate change and many, many others. Um, but those issues, the, I guess the core of the argument is that those issues represent very real financial and competitive risks to those companies, albeit longer term risks. Um, those longer term risks, generally speaking, in my, my hypothesis is, are not reflected in the price of the securities of those companies today. Ergo, you've got a whole litany of systematically mispriced securities. And anybody who comes at that with x-ray glasses that, bring, that have a long-term lens can begin to spot a lot of those opportunities. And again, it would surprise um, some analysts and many money managers that these megatrends that I talked about are, have very, very differential impacts on companies, even if they're in the same industry sector. So some work, for example, some work that we did um, in my previous incarnation, we looked at the 26 electric utilities in the S&P 500 in the US, large cap electric utilities, from the standpoint of what is their net, not gross, but net exposure to the whole concatenation of risks associated with climate. Well, there's a delta of 30 there. So the riskiest company is 30 times riskier than the least risky on an issue that our friends, the, those well-known Marxists from the World Economic Forum in Davos, have told us is the business issue of the millennium. I search in vain for a chief investment officer or an analyst, unless they're being advised by Valerie, to tell me which is which. And I think, again, the, the key hypothesis here is that these longer term risk and value factors and drivers um, will in fact pop up and manifest themselves over three, five, ten year time period. They're not being priced in now and if one brings that perspective to bear, um, it's simply a huge information advantage and a chance for investors, asset owners, asset managers to, uh, to outperform. So maybe I don't know. I mean, I'd like to hear feedback on this later. Um, maybe the way to go in 
terms of trying to get some traction for longer-term investing is to leave the normative stuff to one side or keep going, but add to it that, yeah, again, this isn't about, it doesn't have to be about doing the right thing. It could be about making more money. And last time I checked, most of the denizens of the city and Wall Street are totally on side with that. Thank you very much. For more information, please visit www.gresham.ac.uk.